If you can totally change the way you appear online, how are you going to feel about what you actually look like in person? Welcome to Profoundly Pointless. My name is Nick. In this episode, we're going to talk about body image. We'll be looking at the subtle ways that media and the people around us influence us, muscle dysmorphia, and how social media filters and AI are changing the way we feel about ourselves. This is body image researcher and social psychologist, Dr. Jacqueline Siegel. Thank you for joining us. Like and subscribe if you get a chance. Do people generally see themselves the way the world sees them? Or is our body image thrown off? That's a bit of a complicated question. I don't know if I can say with any certainty about at the population level, but we can say that lots of people have a distorted perception of their body. So they might see their body as being larger or smaller or more muscular or less muscular than it actually is. And we know that when people feel as though their body doesn't meet what they would like for their body to look like or feel like or be like, we know that that's where some of the complexities and some of the issues around body image can come in. So even if people's bodies do meet what they want their bodies to look like or what they want their bodies to feel like or be able to do, if they perceive that their body isn't like that, if they perceive that their body is discrepant from the ideal, we know that some people... Um, can then unfortunately find themselves in a situation where they're experiencing body dissatisfaction. It varies from person to person and the types of bodies that people idealize, the types of pe bodies that people want to have or want their bodies to look like is oftentimes a function of gender and other social norms around bodies. So gender, culture, age is also part of it. But as far as at the population level, do more people have distorted perceptions of their bodies than not? I don't have that precise data, but we know that it is a problem for a lot of people. I guess, where does it get distorted? Do we do it or does society kind of influence us to do it, influence us to do it? So there are various theoretical perspectives that could potentially inform an answer to that. I'm a social psychologist. My PhD is in social psychology. So a lot of my research focuses on the social factors that contribute to body image dissatisfaction. And so something that we study a lot is body ideals. So we have ideals in society for what people's bodies are supposed to look like. And we know that those, I mean, the most obvious ones are uh, gender-based, the most obvious difference between these ideals. Typically for women, the ideal perpetuated through the media, through social media, through editing apps, through uh, the messages that were communicated, uh, the, I'm sorry, the, me the messages that are communicated to us from peers, parents, uh, partners, they center around this idea of a curvaceously thin ideal. So for people with female bodies, um, your waist is supposed to be thin, your breasts are supposed to be large, your booty's supposed to be large, you're not supposed to have any cellulite. We, we refer to this as the curvaceously thin ideal. The thin ideal was really in fashion for women's bodies for a long time, but we see movement towards uh, more accentuated sexualized features more recently. For men and for folks with male bodies, we see a mesomorphic or lean ideal being perpetuated for men, where it's less about thinness and curves, but more about musculature and being lean and muscular. We know that these ideals also vary, at least in their effect on people by sexual orientation. We know that sexual minority men, so gay and bisexual men, have this ideal perpetuated um, potentially differently than... Uh, heterosexual men, where for a lot of sexual minority men, leanness, so being thin and muscular, is really important for sexual minority men, whereas for heterosexual men, we might just see that musculature, but the leanness or the thinness is a bit less important. So body ideals can contribute to the way that we feel about our body, because the body ideals we have in society generally are unrealistic and unattainable for most people. If we look to the media, we look to movies, we look to photoshopped pictures on social media, we know that we're either seeing a distorted picture based on photoshopping or we're seeing people who get paid all day long to be hot. They work out, they have personal trainers, they have oftentimes great genetics that put them in a place where their bodies are more likely to look like what is idealized in society. So if we're making upward social comparisons to them, we're potentially going to feel worse about our bodies. 
And there are all sorts of other reasons as well. We live in a society that really stigmatizes um, people in fat bodies. We know that we live in a society that really stigmatizes people um, based on skin tone and uh, skin blemishes and things of that nature. And so we have these ideals in society for body image. And if you feel as though you're failing to meet them or you're receiving information from other people that you're failing to meet them, you might feel worse about your body. How does it kind of transition from somebody who maybe feels a little bit insecure, so to speak, right? Like I'll use myself as an example. I'm I'm chubby, right? Like I'm a little bit chubbier than I probably should be from a medical perspective, right? Like the doctor has said, you could lose like 10 pounds. How do we distinguish from somebody that maybe is a little bit insecure, maybe needs a little bit of dose of reality to somebody who's like, oh, it's venturing into the the territory of a problem. Yeah. So something that is a helpful guide, especially when it comes to the behaviors in which you're engaging with your body, is whether or not you feel like you have control over it. So if you are engaged in a diet or something because you think that you want to like get more nutrients in your body, you want to um, increase the number of fruits and vegetables you're having compared to some of the other food groups. If you're in control of that, and let's say you go to a birthday party and there's a cake and you say, well, it's a birthday party. Of course, I'm going to have a piece of cake. This is a normal reaction to have. That might be okay. But if you're in a situation where you go to a birthday party, you've been trying to increase your fruit and vegetable intake or whatever. You go to a birthday party and you say, well, I can't eat that because I'm so focused on my health, because I'm so focused on changing the shape of my body. Then you know you might be venturing into that dangerous territory because then you might not be in control. The thoughts about your body and the thoughts about um, the way that you look might be in control. And so thinking about, could I stop this? Could I turn this off? That's a way to, at least as it relates to eating, that might be a way to gauge if you're falling into problematic territory. As far as the thoughts surrounding body image, you might ask yourself something like, am I experiencing, and this is sort of clinical language, but am I exp experiencing distress and impairment related to my body image? So am I experiencing distress about it? Do I feel horrible? Do I think about my body image for more than an hour a day? Are these thoughts about my body intrusive? Do they get in the way of me doing other things that I want to do in my life? When I'm at work, am I thinking about what my body looks like even if no one is around me? That might be problematic. And then the other side of that is impairment. Am I avoiding going out on dates because I'm concerned that someone is going to judge my body? Am I avoiding sex because I think that my partner might judge my body? That's that impairment piece. And so are you experiencing distress and impairment? If so, you might be falling into these problematic body thoughts. Is it generally an internal thing in the sense that the person has kind of, I'll use this word, I don't mean this word, created these thoughts? Or is it an external thing where like, no, I only feel this way because somebody has said something to me. Like my mom said something to me when I was little or my partner or whatever. Is it more internal or kind of external? I think that if we didn't have like media and people telling us what our bodies are supposed to look like, we probably wouldn't have ideal bodies. So I think that the, I don't know if there is an internal response to this. I think a lot of this is external. I think that we receive information from peers, parents, partners, and the media about what bodies are supposed to look like and whether it's being said to us directly or we're hearing it around us or seeing it shown to us, I think that we're getting it from external sources a lot of the time. And that's a really social psych perspective on it. Um, I think evolutionary psychologists um, might say something like, well, the ideal body that we see in society reflects a body that is genetically fit. That's oftentimes a an evolutionary perspective on body image, but as a social psychologist, I tend to stick to the immediate social influences. Is there a way to treat it? So we have treatments that have some degree of effectiveness for these conditions. Treating body image concerns that are not at the clinical level is obviously easier than treating a clinically significant eating disorder or diagnosis of body dysmorphic disorder. If someone shows up into the clinical therapy room and they say, you know, I feel kind of bummed about my body. I wish I looked a little different. Then we could do standard uh, therapy. We could do cognitive behavioral therapy to help people change their thoughts and behaviors around their body. 
If a person comes in with an eating disorder, depending on the specific eating disorder that they are presenting with, we might have to engage in nutritional rehabilitation, um, really altering the behaviors associated with, um, with the condition. And so we have various levels of care for eating disorders. For something like body dysmorphic disorder, there are, of course, also therapies. Clinical psychologists are constantly studying these topics and trying to find effective treatments for them. But things like exposure therapies can be nerve-wracking, but potentially helpful. But cognitive behavioral therapy is really what we regard as the gold standard for a lot of these conditions right now. So I'm not I'm not entirely clear on the difference between body dysmorphia and um, body image. Like what's 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 the difference? Sure. So are you familiar with the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual? Only that I have heard those words before. Okay. So the DSM, or the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, is sort of the handbook for psychological and psychiatric conditions. If you have a diagnosis, typically those diagnoses are listed in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And these are clinically significant conditions. So the eating disorders, well, the feeding and eating disorders are one category of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And these include things like anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, uh, binge eating disorder, other specified feeding or eating disorder, avoidant and restrictive food intake disorder, conditions that are significant. And then um, within the obsessive compulsive and related disorders, body dysmorphic disorder and muscle dysmorphia as a subcategory are their own specific conditions. You might have negative body image, uh, which exists on a spectrum um, that doesn't necessarily meet the criteria for one of these clinically significant conditions. So you might be experiencing negative body image that is different than body dysmorphic disorder. And your negative body image might be something like, I feel like I'm too short. And that might be a negative thought that you have about your body. Body dysmorphic disorder or body dysmorphia is sort of fixation on a particular body part. Is this a new thing? And I'm talking about it in the kind of broad circumstances, right? Like all of the things that we have talked about. Is this newer or was this something that like, no, people had this in the 1500s or in 500 BCE or... I believe that the first two documented cases of eating disorders were in the 1500s. Um, And one was a man and one was a woman. So a lot of people think that men don't get eating disorders, but uh, even the first documented cases of eating disorders were among men and women. We know that men comprise roughly 25 to 33 percent of eating disorder cases as well. Um, But these have been around for a while. Dissatisfaction about body and Uh, engagement behavior to try to change or alter the size or shape of the body. They've been kicking around for a while. There certainly have been um, advancements, I question mark. Uh, I hesitate to use the word advancements, but there have been changes to society that made it so that negative body image is potentially more likely. I mean, just through the emergence of the media, um, you know, we look There was a really fascinating study conducted, or at least I believe it was published in roughly 2001. I believe Becker, Carolyn Becker is the author, though I'd have to double check that. But she looked at young girls' body image in Fiji prior to the emergence of like Western body ideals through the media. And then she looked at them after. And what she found was there was a significant difference, significant significant worsening in body image among young girls in Fiji. Um, after the introduction of Western media. So we know that media and seeing these idealized bodies all around us in advertisements, on our TV, on social media, all around us all the time can contribute to feeling negatively about your body. So um, they've definitely been around for a while. I think it's possible that we're seeing increased levels of body image dissatisfaction right now. Is it still increasing? Because it seems like in the last couple of years, whatever, I, you know, it's been okay, this is my body, and now models that used to fit this one exact characteristic, now there's all kinds of different body types. Is that working, or has that like had no effects? I see it both ways in the sense that we've made steps to accommodate or to um, accept all bodies, for lack of better phrases. But at the same time, like we're still pretty judgmental about everything. The short answer is I'm not sure. Uh, The long answer is that it is true that in social media and in, I mean, even in the runways and and on TV, we're seeing a we're seeing a wider diversity of bodies being represented. 
We do also know that those bodies, when they don't meet this thin, lean, muscular, whatever ideal, are oftentimes subjected to relentless criticism in the media, on social media. Have you ever read the comments section for a, a woman who is plus size who posts a photo of herself? Um, oftentimes, folks are met with stigma and shame, again, because of this immense fat phobia that we have in society. That has not changed. While we are still seeing a little bit of flexibility, you know, you might see a woman who's a size zero, as well as a woman who's like a size eight, maybe you'll see women in that range, we're not really seeing a lot of acceptance beyond sort of standard or straight sizes, especially for women. And I would actually argue that it's potentially even getting worse for men as this lean and muscular ideal continues to be perpetuated. And I would, you know, I, I'm particularly sensitive to men's struggles. Um, I direct an eating disorder prevention program for men. And I I think that men don't have uh, as much of, men don't have as many opportunities to talk about body image. Men oftentimes uh, don't see the behaviors in which they are engaged to change the shape of their body as being problematic or troubling. And other men and women oftentimes encourage those behaviors in men. So many men are sort of struggling in silence because they dislike their bodies, but there's no real avenue for discussing or no real outlet for discussing their body image related concerns. So while these men might be having these thoughts, these negative thoughts about their bodies or feeling like their body is too small or not sufficiently muscular, they might be having these thoughts many hours of the day who is telling them that, hey, you're experiencing distress and impairment, it might be time to get help. Not many people and not many men are going to seek out help on their own if they don't see it as a problem. We already know that men are less likely to seek help, particularly for mental health conditions compared to women. So I, I really feel for men as it relates to body image. Are they struggling and again, give me some leeway kind of with the terms and things like that. Are they struggling at the same level? Because when I have always thought about it, it's like, okay, well, this is something that happens to women and some men get it as well. But are men, is it, is it the same type of level or is it just kind of, no, really men actually get this a lot too? It depends on the person. I, I Again, I don't have population level statistics, but... When men experience eating disorders or muscle dysmorphia, it can be as intense and severe as women's experiences of, of eating disorders as well. Is there certain, does it mainly affect certain age groups, either in men or women, or is it kind of across the lifetime? A lot of research on eating disorders is limited by stereotypes that we have about the conditions. So we refer to this stereotype as the swag stereotype. And when we think about people with eating disorders, we think about skinny, white, affluent girls, swag. Um, and that means that a lot of the research attention has been focused on young, white women who are relatively affluent experiences of eating disorders. Eating disorders do affect people across the age, gender, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status spectrum. Anyone is potentially susceptible to them. We have more research on young women's experiences, but that doesn't necessarily mean that other people are not experiencing, experiencing them as well. We just don't see as much research on them. How does this, I know we've kind of talked about it, but how does this generally like affect people in their, in their lives? Uh, badly. <laughs> um, so a lot of, I, I laugh for folks. No, I know, I know what you mean. I know what you mean, right. Well, no. just an additional caveat is that I'm in recovery from anorexia. Um, I was in treatment for anorexia when I was 21. I spent 10 weeks <laughs> in the treatment center. I know what it's like to have an eating disorder. Um, and now I do this research. So recovery is possible. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. But a lot of my research now focuses on how having an eating disorder affects everyday experiences. So everyday social experiences. So I've published research on how eating disorders affect people's experiences of being at work and how it affect and how the workplace also affects people's experiences of eating disorders and how this has the potential to affect people's experiences in their jobs, their productivity, as well as how people maintain their eating disorder recovery in their workplaces. I've looked at this in women and in men. And then also a lot of my research right now is focused on romantic relationships for folks with eating disorders. And what we see is that if an eating disorder is active, meaning that treatment either is not being pursued or this treatment experience is not effective, people oftentimes really struggle 
in their workplaces, in their relationships, because, I mean, for a variety of different reasons, some of which are health related, oftentimes people with eating disorders face health consequences, but also eating disorders suck (laughs) and they're very cognitively taxing. And if you are having these thoughts about your body, about your eating, potentially up to like 85% of the day, it's going to be really difficult to focus on your work. And if you are in a relationship and you have an eating disorder, there are lots of experiences in romantic relationships that will then be very challenging for you. So in my research, some of the various stressors that we have identified is going out to eat. How many times is your first date with someone? Let's get dinner. Let's get drinks. For folks for whom food, eating, and your body is the most distressing thing, well, that's going to be then very difficult for you to focus on that experience. The same is true of sex. If you feel extremely uncomfortable about what your body looks like, even under clothes, how are you possibly going to feel comfortable and open to sexual experiences? We see a lot of sexual dysfunction and sexually dysfunctional attitudes among folks with eating disorders. Others include things like going on vacation. Um, You know, if you're going to the beach with your partner and you feel dissatisfied about your body, you might feel as though you have to hide your body for some reason. And there are various, various others. We know that the ways that couples work through these stressors can make it so that people can feel more comfortable in their bodies, make it so that people feel um, comfortable and safe to show their body and share their experiences with their partner. But it's complicated. Um, It's a very, it's a very difficult process. And trusting someone so much and enough that you feel comfortable disclosing to them that you have an eating disorder and sharing your treatment with them, that takes a lot of trust because eating disorders are also really stigmatized. And people might be afraid that their partners won't accept them if they learn that they are recovering from an eating disorder. So eating disorders really have a significant impact on lots of areas of life because of the detrimental social, interpersonal, and health consequences of them. It sounds terrible. Like, no matter what you're doing, that's the only thing that you can think about, right? Like, you can't enjoy any aspect of life because all you're thinking about is, like, what what do I look like? God, that's got to be so bad. Yes. Do, it does, is. <laughs> does society care in the sense that, like, Right. Or is it one of those things where like you tell somebody that like, hey, I'm struggling with this. Do people seem reactive to it or are they kind of like, oh, yeah, OK, all right. Um, I think that's a complicated question. I think that eating disorders are oftentimes trivialized. People think that eating disorders are controllable, that you could just stop at any point. Um this is one of the primary stigmas attributed to people with eating disorders is that they're just doing it for attention or they're vain or they they should be able to control it. But one of the primary elements of having an eating disorder is feeling like it's out of control or out of your control. Um, I think that in particular, men's body image concerns are trivialized. I think that especially people who are not thin Um, When they experience dissatisfaction about their body, sometimes people regard that as being like good or appropriate. Um, We see, again, I know we've talked about this, but the amount of fat shame we have in society is really appalling. And so we, as psychologists, we don't want anyone to feel shame, dissatisfaction, or discomfort in their bodies. Everyone deserves to feel good in their bodies. Um, but when people who are not thin say that they feel dissatisfied with their bodies, oftentimes people will say, well, just lose weight. That's not the answer to body dissatisfaction. (laughs) The answer to body dissatisfaction is learning to feel comfortable in your skin, regardless of the weight that you're in. And so, um, there's mixed societal reactions. Some people recognize the seriousness of eating disorders, but I would say most people don't. Anorexia nervosa is one of the core eating disorders, and it has the second highest mortality rate of any psychiatric condition, second only to opioid use disorder. And there are two reasons why anorexia um, is has the potential to uh, be deadly. The first of which is the health complications that come from malnutrition. If you are restricting what you eat, if you are denying the severity of being at a low weight, you're probably not thinking too much about like, hey, am I nourishing my body enough to live? 
So we see health complications and specifically cardiac complications for folks with anorexia, but we also see elevated suicidality. And so eating disorders are very, very, very serious conditions. I don't know if people recognize the seriousness of them. Um, I will say that I think that our healthcare system also really fails people with eating disorders. Um, it's very difficult and expensive to go to eating disorder treatment. And even our most effective treatments that we have for eating disorders are generally only effective for roughly 50% of the population. And so I think that it's possible that people care, but we don't yet, we haven't yet figured out exactly how to help everyone. And so it is complicated. <laughs> I think there are layers to it. Um, yeah. I will say though, Biden just signed um, a bill, I believe, to support eating disorders research and treatment. So there seems to be structural support for treating eating disorders. Um, are you ready for some listener submitted questions? Sure. Do you ever see this really changing? <laughs> oh, that is direct. Um, I have hope, I will say. I have hope for things getting better. I have hope for our treatments being more effective. I have hope for um, mental health resources becoming easier to access. I have hope that people who are who might not otherwise seek out treatment might see the benefits of getting help. I am hopeful for these things. Um, right now, I don't see much well. First thing I'll say is that there are activists doing unbelievable work. There are fat activists, there are specifically black women doing unbelievable work to try to promote um, like radical, radical body acceptance. Sonia Renee Taylor comes to mind immediately. There are people doing great work to create a society that is accepting of people of all bodies and their work should not be minimized. The work that they're doing is unbelievable. That said, Within the broader society, there are a lot of trends happening right now that are troubling. I mean, two things that come to mind immediately are TikTok filters, um, you know, image editing in, uh, yeah, image editing on social media um, that is becoming more and more prevalent. And then I don't know if folks are familiar with this, but this Ozempic craze where people are going out and getting diabetes medication and injecting it in themselves in the hopes that it will help them lose weight. Um, this is a, an, ep I mean, I don't want to use epidemic. Epidemic has a very specific, uh, very specific meaning, but this is happening more and more where people are either getting prescribed Ozempic, people are, or other um, medications like it, but people are going to their doctors and trying to get this quote unquote miracle weight loss drug that's actually a diabetes medication and the cultural conversations around it are very very troubling and when you said earlier we're seeing more bodies represented are things getting better uh, the ozempic craze comes to mind immediately because i think that this is a a reflection of attitudes that people have had for a while that the thin, curvaceously thin, lean, whatever ideal continues to be perpetuated. And if people think that it's attainable, they will go to great lengths to do it. So there are things happening in society right now that uh, dampen my enthusiasm and dampen my hope. Um, but that said, the work that is being done, the very hard, hard, unbelievable, brilliant work being done does give me hope when I speak with activists and things, but it's not great out there right now. It does definitely seem like we say one thing and then, but we, then we do another, right? Like all bodies yeah. are accepted. You should change, right? Like it seems that yeah. balance. That's, that was another one of our question is what do you think about filters? I think that we have research to suggest that viewing idealized Viewing photos of idealized bodies has a negative impact on people's uh, body image. 
if you are making upward social comparisons, and I've used that language before, but it's a social psych term, meaning you are looking at something or you're comparing yourself to someone who you perceive to be better than you, you will feel worse about yourself. So if you're looking at someone, and I, I don't mean to do, say this in objectifying terms, but just for simplicity's sake, you're looking at someone and you think their body is like a 10, you think it meets the ideal, and you see yourself as like a six, well, then you're going to feel shitty because you're making that upward social comparison with them. And you're going to say, why am I not a 10? You know, so if you're looking at other people's idealized bodies, you'll feel bad about yourself. If you're looking at your own idealized body, um, not only are there potentially negative consequences for how you see yourself, but then other people, if you post those photos, are seeing an idealized version of you, which then could potentially also make them feel bad. So I'm not a big supporter of the filters, um, truthfully. I do worry about what they are doing for individual body image as well as sort of societal body image. But yeah, I guess I'll stop there. I know nothing about this, but I've seen some of the most recent TikTok filters and I immediately thought, oh, that's a bad idea for all of us. Like, oh, that's yeah. bad. For any for I self-confidence, like that, I, that's not what I look like. Then you feel like you have to look like that all the time. I hope that goes away. I will be very interested to see how social media continues to advance. And I think AI, uh, I mean, I, I, I hesitate to, to use the term AI because people who actually know what AI is will probably be like, well, that woman doesn't know anything about yeah, AI. Yeah, we'll give you and leeway. Accurate. We'll give you leeway. Yeah, right. um, but, I, I'm troubled by how advancements might affect some of these filters as well. Um, if you can totally change the way you appear online, how are you going to feel about what you actually look like in person? I don't know. You can say it. We're fucked. <laughs> like, this is going to get yeah. bad. This is going to get bad. Um, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully. Well, we got to figure. Yeah, I think everybody knows it. We can leave that one there. Um, God, there's not like, usually we get some lighter hearted ones, but it's not like it's a lighter hearted okay. thing. It's okay. We can stick with um, how would you how has how has pornography affected people's bodies image people's body i've used an extra possessive in there somewhere i'm not sure so um so i teach psychology of human sexual behavior at san diego state and i teach about body image and sexuality um so the there is a long and a short answer as as usual so if you look across the body of research, the corpus of research looking at pornography and body image, you'll see mixed results. A recent systematic review was just published within the last few years that showed that exposure to pornography is associated with poorer body image and across studies. And so while there's variability in these findings, we know that the more consistent thread is that pornography is associated with negative body image. Um, there's also research to suggest that women who believe that their partners watch more porn are more likely to demonstrate eating disorder symptoms. Um, and there are lots of reasons why people might feel bad about their bodies when they watch porn, when they watch more porn in particular. While there is a wide variety of different types of porn, mainstream pornography largely features very specific, idealized bodies. Um, I don't really have to describe what they are, but curvaceously thin ideal and muscular, you know, lean ideal. But also we see... Uh, people oftentimes also report, um, uh, uh, what was the word I'm thinking of? Oh, dissatisfaction with sexual functioning after watching porn as well. And this oftentimes has to do with this weird spectacle of pornography. We see penises that are much larger than people's penises actually are. People report genital image dissatisfaction after watching pornography. We see also just like spectacles, things happening in porn that don't actually happen in people's sexual experiences. So, there's lots of debate around porn um, for a lot of different reasons, politically, socially, as far as body image, as far as relationships are concerned. Um, the research seems to lend itself to the belief that porn is a good tool for masturbation. Porn has the potential to teach people poor scripts about what sex is supposed to look like and has the potential to give people a false impression of what naked bodies and sexy bodies are supposed to look like. So porn is not necessarily a universal bad, but... It, it doesn't seem to do wonders for body image. Do men know what they're supposed to look like now? The super body you see on the cover of men's fitness and then you see the dad bod and it's like, well, which one am I supposed to be? Because 
I think that it's a question that a lot of people think, but I encourage listeners to reframe this question. Um, who are you having a body for? Are you having your body for other people to look at? Is your body something for other people to gaze at? Or do you have a body to be lived in and enjoyed and to experience pleasure and to experience, you know, the joys of doing fun exercise and fun activities and hugging the people you love? Your body is not an ornament for other people to view. Your body is supposed to be lived in. It's a tool for doing the other things you want to do. So, um... I encourage everyone to get away from language of what my body should look like and think more about what do I want my body to have the capacity to do. So for me, I want my body to have the capacity to hug my unbelievably amazing partner. I love him so much. And I love that my body has the functionality to do that. Um, I love that my body allows me to hike and my body allows me to climb mountains. That's something that I love. But if I fixate on what I think my body is supposed to look like to other people, then I'll probably always feel dissatisfied. But if I start function, if I start focusing on my body's functionality rather than its appearance, then I can start feeling better about my body. So I encourage the the asker to reflect on for whom you have a body, uh, and if it's not you, that might be worth doing a little soul search and a little digging inside yourself to try to find out why you think your body should look a certain way for other people instead of why your body should be lived in by you. That makes a lot of sense. Like, I don't like the way that I look right now, but I more for me, right? Like, oh, I, I could, I could do a little bit better. Like I could fix that for myself, not for necessarily for anybody else. Um, is there anything you think that we missed or any like, Oh, we should talk about this. Um, I will just say that there are, ways to improve body image there you don't have to live dissatisfied with your body if you are feeling dissatisfied with your body talking to a therapist can be really helpful but some other strategies that we know from the literature can be helpful include things like spending more time in nature if you are doing things with your body instead of thinking about what your body looks like then you have the potential to increase and elevate your body image similarly focusing on functionality over appearance empirically we know that people who have higher body functionality appreciation are less likely to have body image dissatisfaction i'm trying to think of some others oh being more self-compassionate with yourself this is some of my research i probably should have remembered but if you take a more self-compassionate self-perspective you recognize that everyone goes through hardships you you practice self-kindness that can potentially help you with some of these uh, negative feelings you might experience about your body. Um, really just trying to think of some others that come off the top of my head. Oh, and then think about the media that you are engaging with. If you go on your Instagram and every time you grow off of it, you feel awful about your body image, maybe think about the images that you're exposing yourself to. Maybe think about the content in which you are engaging and how you're engaging with it. You don't have to follow influencers that make you feel like shit about your body. You can follow whoever you want. Um, and so sometimes the social media cleanse can be great for uh, improving body image. But I think what I really want to stress is that regardless of your gender, regardless of your race, regardless of your sexual orientation, if you are experiencing body image dissatisfaction that results, or that results in distress or impairment in your life, getting help is a great idea. Um, there are lots of people who specialize in this. There are lots of options available. A lot of therapists offer sliding scales. There's also lots of great resources online. Um, but you don't have to live your whole life hating your body. And as someone who has recovered from an eating disorder, I promise you life is much better when you don't spend 85% of your day <laughs> wishing that your body looked a different way. Do you feel like people see you how you actually are? Now, now I do. Yeah. M maybe... Uh... Any any time before ten years ago, I would have said no. But now now people people can see me. I wear a pretty wear my emotions and my personality kind of out there now. I, I I never used to do that as a younger person. I've always generally been a little surprised at what people thought of me. It wasn't always what I expected. My question has always been, which one of those is actually the truth? the way that you see yourself or the way that other people see you? Like, which is really a more accurate representation of who you are as a person? 
This actually kind of plays into what I want to know about how you had a, the manliest weekend ever. Easily. Easily the manliest weekend that I have ever had in my life was on Saturday. I woke up hungover. I then went to the gym and I did bench. I then came home, played sports with my kids. My wife and I had an intimate rendezvous. <laughs> I watched sports. I bet on sports. I then went outside and chopped down a tree with an axe, split law, split bricks, fucking bricks. Like I spit split stone for the patio. Then I fixed the disposal. Then I got drunk on Saturday night. The only way that my weekend could have been manlier is if I would have like fixed part of, done something with the car. Oh, and I was by a fire. I was by a fire, which I started. It's a propane fire, wow. but I still technically started the fire. I don't know how I could have had a more manly day. I, I mean, that, that's that's a full day. That's a that's a lot lot to pack into one. No wonder your testosterone was flowing. Flowing. What what would you consider of my weekend? What part of that would you say was the manliest part of it? Probably, you know, the the brick thing seems pretty impressive to me. It's actually, have you ever had to split stone? No. It's actually a lot easier than you would think. Do You you actually don't hit it very hard. It's just a series of light taps. Little tappa tappa. Little taps. I would See, say that probably the manliest thing was the chopping down of the tree with an axe. Because why would having an intimate relation with your wife rank up there? Mm, you were crying, I mean, weren't you? Well, I mean, I like to be held afterwards, and there wasn't as much time... For that as I would like. So that was probably the least manliest part of my day. Well, I, I have nothing to... I mean, my weekend was not like that, so I'm sounds fantastic. All right, let's give uh, some shout-outs now, shall we? And surprisingly enough, uh, it just must have been the episode, but all of my shout-outs are to, are to men. They're all male shout-outs this episode. I don't think I've ever had a shout-outs in our illustrious career where it's been all one sex before. Our listeners are it's actually pretty close to half and half men and women, so I feel like this is pure laziness or uh, bias on your part. Uh, well, I'm going to say neither, uh, and I'm just going to go into it because that was semi-rude. Uh, all right. Joseph Lopez, appreciate you. Uh, Miles Edwards, Zach Tower, Corey Bellinger, uh, and Corey is spelled K-O-R-I. But the profile picture, I, I you know, it's gonna stay with with it being a being a boy here. Uh, Alejandro, do you think that what was the first person's name? Uh, J Joseph Lopez. Do you think people call him J Lo? <laughs> oh boy, here we go. Um, I do. I have no idea. You think so? Oh, hundred percent. And I'm a hundred percent sure he fucking hates it. Yeah. I'm not going to, yeah, I have, yeah, yep. Uh, Alejandro Marquez, Jeremiah Clark, Ryan DeCaro, Ryan Jackson, Angelo Gabriel, and Drew Miller. You all get the shout outs this week. I have some poll results. So we put up a poll on our YouTube channel about how many people know someone who is not related but has the same last names. No, wait, okay. How many people know two people or more with the same last name that are not related? 90% of people do. 90% of people said they knew someone, like two Thomases or two Smiths. I thought it'd be lo much lower than that. No, I don't. Uh, it does not surprise me. As I I mean, I think I went through three or four names, and you, can, you couldn't even come up with one. So The only one I could eventually come up with was knowing two Thomases. Then I realized that I made the other one up. I didn't actually know him. Logan, Tom Logan Thomas was a player for the Arizona Cardinals, who slightly, shamefully, I actually think that my son's name is Logan Thomas Vinzant, but it's not. It's not his middle name, and I get his own middle name wrong because of Logan Thomas, the football player. I couldn't even tell you right now what his middle name is. Your own son? I get confused as to which one it is. It's either Joseph or Marcus. I get confused. I have to go like ask my wife. Wow. Uh, okay. I mean, listen, I'm not going to judge, but I'm kind of judging you right now. 
Do you, okay, how many of your cousin's middle names do you know? Do you know your, any of your cousin's middle names? No. No, I can't off the top of my head. I'm going to go ahead and say that you know 1% of people's middle names. 1%? I mean, uh, no. I, I think you know maybe... I wouldn't say it's more than 15, but I think you're in that... I think you're in that ballpark. Of the all the people you know, you think you know 15% of their middle names? Can we can we keep it to like close friends and family? I mean, out of all the people I know, I mean, you know a lot of people. Okay, let's just do even people you talk to on a yearly basis. I still think it's 1%. I'll go 6%, I think. I think it's pretty low. I could go with the most 5%. I know my wife's middle name. One of my sons, my dad's, I, and yours, only because it's Euclid, which is I'm not. A, I'm not even sure. I, I I know you. I, I uh, one of my good friends named Nick. His middle name is John. Your middle name is not John. It's not. You want to start a new segment called "Guess My Middle Name." Let's start a let's start a weekly segment where you try to guess my <laughs> middle name. We're gonna start this on three twenty on March 29th, two thousand twenty three, and we'll see how long it takes John to guess my middle name. Why? I think it might take. I think it might take two years. No. Why? Oh, yeah, because for... it's not a common middle name. It's not a name that I would make an argument. That it's not a name that most people have even heard of. It's not an wow. uncommon name, but a, not a name that people have heard. Well, then that throws my first guess out the window. But you know what? I'll get this letter out of the way. Okay. Okay. Uh, I was going to say Christopher. No. That is that is the right letter, though, to start Wait, with. Wait. I know it. Uh, Kashmir. Nope. No. That was it. That was your one guess. That's actually okay, that's fine. your only guess. I think it might take you two years to get it. I'm going to have the right letter, though. I got it out of the way. So I've obviously have heard it at some point. There's a lot of C names, though. Yeah. Okay. All right. We can take right, bets. Uh, is, it, is it illegal to take bets? How long will it take <laughs> you to guess my middle name? Go to social media and put some money down on when I'll guess it. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see. Uh, what is more useless to you or, or has become more useless to you? Uh, eBay or Amazon? I've never used eBay in my entire life. Never used it once. Oh. Now, see, that's an interesting... I, I would be interesting to see the results in that poll question. Like how, how many, many people, people have never eBay? used... Yeah, or haven't used eBay. Because I, I feel like, at least once again in my inner circle, everyone's used eBay. It's just like a commonplace thing. But you're collecting and selling weird shit, right? Yeah, Don't but you I have mean, action figure collections and baseball cards and? Yeah, but I mean, I mean, I, I also like my mother has bought soap, soap off eBay before. Like, you know, just wait ran. a minute. She bought soap off. That's something I'm not buying off of eBay. Is soap? Yeah, I, I don't know. It was, it was some soap that they used to sell in stores. And then it got discontinued in stores or something or discontinued in its entirety. So she would buy it on eBay in like packs of 50. What kind of soap is it? It's a good soap. Uh, I, I remember the name of it. I don't remember what it's what it I don't remember. It's called Kame or Kame like C-A-M-A-Y. Can is there a reason you can share why she liked that particular soap? I don't know. It's just one of those things I remember from my childhood. We always had to have, you know, the soap in the in the shower. I, I don't know why she liked it, but she liked it. Is it bar soap or uh, like more the like you squirted out of the bottle soap? Yeah, it's definitely uh, bar soap, and it was like a tan pinkish, if I remember right. So, are you a bar soap man or a bottle soap man? Um. I guess bottle. I mean, I haven't had a bar in years. Hmm. Do you use a washcloth? I find it very weird when people use washcloths. I don't understand washcloths at all. It's so funny you asked me that. Uh, I, I think I use a loofah. I understand the loofah least of all. 
Because the washcloth, you're just wiping the other day's dirt around on you unless you're using a new washcloth every time. But at least you can wash the washcloth. If you're using a loofah, you've had like dirt built up on that sucker for months or more that you're just wiping around on you again. No, I mean, you wash the loofah after you're done. You know, you rinse it off. It's not like you're just putting it back. I actually you're, really you're not really washing it, right? Like you're doing the equivalent of like I'm going to wash my hands and you stick them under water for 5 seconds and call it good. You're not really washing the thing. You're just scrubbing yourself I, with your own dirt. I I love my loofah, all right? It's you can scrub, you can get nice and deep in there and it makes sure you feel refreshed and your skin feels good. Hmm. It's good. Okay. Is it the loofah that you're just holding or is it a loofah attached to like a stick? You have a stick loofah. You can get your back. I'm ashamed to admit this. Uh, I have I have two kinds of loofahs. You have two kinds of loofahs in the shower. I do. <laughs> I have this. I have the stick kind, and then I have like the little, you know, the one that you hold in your hand, and you can, you know, get in certain areas that are easier to get than the one that's attached to the, you know, the. Okay. Stick. But you, which one did you start with? And then thought to yourself, which one did you start with? And then think to yourself, you know what? I need a different loofah. I need more coverage. Which one did you start with? And which one was the secondary purchase? Uh, <laughs> uh, the smaller one first. And then when I realized I wanted to get to some areas on my back that I couldn't reach with my hands, I bought the stick one. Okay. That, to me, seems like it would be the more logical progression. You wouldn't start with the stick one and then go to the other one. Okay. Listen, I just hope that everyone out there appreciates a loofah. I used to. I used to be a loofah man, but I drifted away from it, and I don't really know when it happened. Just one day I stopped using loofahs. But I would say that there's probably spots on my back that haven't really been cleaned in years. <laughs> it's kind of like how, how some people love bidets, right? Like... I feel like a loofah is you either love it, you hate it, or you just don't know about it. If you don't know about it, you you need you need to go get a loofah. Hmm. Yeah, I've gone through loofah phases. I'm not currently in a loofah phase. Uh, let's see the ne the next thing I had here. Um, this isn't really so much of a question as well. It is a question, but it's not like a either or here. But so I bought a. I went cheap. On my my shaver, my razor blade, and I I went cheap, and I'm fucking regretting it now. So I guess my question to you is: Do you go cheap on on shit? You know, shaving yourself. I don't mind going cheap on razor blades, only because that's going to grow back, right? Mm -hmm. Like if I'm pulling off some layers of skin, I know I got a good shave. So I'm okay with cheap razor blades. You draw a little blood. That's how it's supposed to be done. There's two Oof. things that I've long said that if you're not bleeding after you do it, you're not really doing it right. One is weed whacking. Two is shaving. You've got to draw blood at least once a week or you're not doing it right. I actually thought to myself the other day that I'm going to start wearing jeans when I when I do yard work this summer because I don't want to nick the shit out of my ankles and legs this year with weed whack, uh, weed whacker string. That's not worthy of being laughed at at all. It hurts. Go out there in shorts like a man, right? You're over here buying jeans to cover to cover up your little legs. I'm out there with an axe, chopping down trees and satisfying my <laughs> wife. What are you doing? <laughs> I got to put on jeans before I go outside. I mean, I got you. You shaved me. I got nothing there. I mean, right. there's very few that are listening at this moment that are going, "Yeah, my last weekend I did something more manlier than that," because they didn't. Right? You can't. Right? Like this is the only time I can ever make a manly argument for myself is after this weekend. All other weekends, to be like, "What did you do?" Well, so uh, so I'm pretty excited. So our uh, social media poll this week i kind of set it up on purpose uh knowing that people would want to pick what the winner was which we'll get to in a second uh let's see so the choices were the happiest country excuse me in the world was announced again finland won for like the 14th year in a row i don't know what makes finland the happiest place on earth but 
apparently it keeps getting voted that. Um, but I just have a hard time believing that because it's so cold. Like, it gets pretty cold well, in Finland. And like, who are who? Who's like taking these polls? Like, do you, I, I do don't you think, think it's they're a going poll. to? I think it's a what? I think it's a research study where they're looking at certain metrics and saying, okay, you have this much health care, you have this much wages, you have that stuff. And we've just decided that you're the happiest country on earth, which is why I don't really necessarily feel that way, right? I mean, maybe you should be the happiest or you could be potentially the happiest, but hmm. I don't know. I think you'd have to be in a warmer place personally. It seems like Hawaii should actually win. Hawaii would be fun to, fun to go to state. And, and live. Shout out okay. to Pete Cage. Um, let's see. The uh, scientists made the first 3D printed food recently. Is a 3D printed cheesecake that I'm sure tasted like paper and absolute garbage. Doesn't it still need food to make food? So, like, are we saving food by making? I don't really understand I, that. Yeah, I don't know, right? Because I don't. I don't think anyone's going to eat it. But hey, what what do I know? Um, and then uh, I, I went 50-50 on, on the third choice. The, I had in there a, a teen that biked 20,000 miles after telling his parents he'd be right back the next thing they, they knew he was 20,000 miles away. Um, or the final I four. Cause I the think f- they're checking up on their child very well if yeah. the next thing they knew he was 20,000 miles away. It's not it's like you called kinda- him at 8 and then talked to him again at 7. It's actually kind of an incredible story, really. Um, and then the the final four, which you know is it's it, it's if you're a basketball fan, it's 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 been an insane tournament. If you had money on any of the big dogs, you're pissed off and are, are not watching it. Uh, uh, but hey, I'm putting my money behind Florida Atlantic. Let's have a number nine seed win. Why not? Cool. Who else is in the tournament? Uh, let's see, so it's them: San Diego State, Miami of Florida, and UConn. I've basically stopped watching all big events. I didn't watch the Super Bowl. I didn't really watch March Madness. I don't watch the Oscars, the Grammys, the Tonys. Any kind of big event that's happening on television, I just don't watch it. The last thing was the last season of Game of the end of Game of Thrones. It was the last like big event that was happening at the same time that I was like, okay, I'll watch that too at the same time. You should watch The Last of Us. You'd love that show. Too scary. I can't handle it. Too scary, man. Well, I forgot you are, you are seven. Uh, but hey, you know what? One, no candle of the the candle of the month. Well, it's not candle of the month. This episode comes out on the 29th, and we already did a candle for month March. So God candle damn of the month it. is next week. I totally. <laughs> oh no! Wow, I totally got so excited. Oh fuck! Okay, well, I guess I'll have to wait till next episode. Yeah. I saw that, too. I actually saw the poll that you put up and thought to myself, he doesn't realize that (laughs) Candle of the Month is next week. And your sole focus on this show is now just Candle of the Month. That's the only thing you care about. I'm like, I mean, I'm doing research on candles. I'm having, I mean, I'm probably having now, I don't know, a dozen candles a month delivered to my house. (laughs) How many were you getting before, though? This I mean, is an what did, excuse what did, for your addiction, isn't it? Is this fueling I mean, did, your addiction? I mean, what did I say? I, I, I probably have said, I mean, it was probably no more than four or five. I mean, and, you know, it's, you've some months, increased some, your candle consumption three times. You went from four candles to at 12? Least, at least. Because cause there would be some months where I'm sure it wasn't more than like, you know, one or two. Then some months I probably skipped it. Um, but now I feel like like I have to, you know, I'm invested in Candle of the Month. I feel like you've put more effort into Candle of the Month than anything else second to possibly your children. Maybe even more than your children. I, I can feel the aura. I can feel the energy from our listeners and our viewers. They love Candle of the Month. I think that you're feeding an addiction to buying candles and... Okay, I mean, I support the research, right? I support the research. We just got to make sure this doesn't become a problem when you're buying $150 worth of candles every month, right? <laughs> I um, mean, I thought fucking March was over Tuesday, so that's that's where my mind is. 
March feels like it's one of those months that's over in the middle of it. Like once we pass St. Patrick's Day, March should just be over. Yeah. Um, we should go man, from March 17th to April 1st. I can't believe it's already April, though, pretty much. Like, holy hell, man. Yeah, dude. Days are days are long. Years are short. Uh, okay. Are you ready for a top five, then? I Yeah, I guess so, since I don't know how many days are in a month. Well, it depends. It's anywhere between 28 and 31, depending on the month. There's a trick, like, with your knuckles that you can figure out, where, like, the knuckle... I can never remember, though, if it's the knuckle or in between the knuckles that is 31. But you go, like, January is a knuckle. It's got 31. And February is in the middle, doesn't have 31. Then the next knuckle is 31. April, then May has 31. June has doesn't have it. Yeah, you start with the knuckle and you go January, February, March, April, May. And every time you hit a knuckle, it's the 31st. Uh, so our top five is top five green things. It's your number five. Uh, so this is a tie. It's two logos. It's the Heineken logo and the Starbucks logo. Okay. Both are very recognizable from being where I am in the country. I would say John Deere logo could also make a run for a very recognizable green thing. More than Heineken. In the Midwest where I'm from, I would say it's probably Starbucks and John Deere. Which are... You would never think go together, but uh, you would think would you beer think goes together. Yeah, you would think uh, Heineken and John Deere would go together, but yeah, no. Uh, Heineken, obviously, I mean, it's huge around the world, and Starbucks as well. So, uh, yeah, that's why they're they share the top five spot for me. My number five is the Hulk. Okay, okay. I uh, I surprisingly enough, I I have a couple of like characters on my honorable mention, but I have none on. In my top five. I thought about putting Yoda at number five over the Hulk, but I don't feel like Yoda, although he's a very impactful character, has not had as much development. Like, there's not a lot of stories about Yoda, and that's why I think that he's not as impactful as the Hulk. So I put the Hulk over Yoda. Ooh, Yoda. See, I forgot about Yoda. That, hmm. I may regret not putting him on my list somewhere. Uh, I could actually, I could actually put Grogu ahead of Yoda in terms of oh. like, well, what they've actually got something going on. Like, you know Yoda's cool, but you don't know anything about Yoda. Like, where's Yoda from? Do you know where Yoda's from? No. How old is Yoda? You know anything about him other than that he's Yoda? I, I was going to try to do an impersonation of Yoda, but we have know how my impersonations are, and I'm just not going to do it. I can't do a Yoda impersonation. I don't ever want to, to be honest with you. I do find it funny when people do it, but I can't do it. What's your number four? Uh, Christmas trees. You better have a pretty... S okay. It's going to really depend what you have up above that. I feel like that's a pretty high, a pretty low for a Christmas tree, to be honest with you. Well, I mean, you know, number one should be easy. It won't be because it's you and me doing this. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I, I have the three above it are, I think are pretty good ones. So my number four is chameleons, not because I like chameleons, but only the idea of like changing color and stuff like that's pretty cool. I'll give it to chameleons for that. Huh? Okay. I, I mean, I think that's pretty weak to be on your top five, but you know, because okay. I, in terms of the animal kingdom, I'm not even sure that they're top three green animal i think Don't they're top me. wait okay who are you gonna oh, put yeah, above I... them i i thought about putting crocodiles ahead of yeah chameleons but chameleons can change color which is something that not a lot of things can do so i think that they get i think they get a little bit uh, more credit which makes me wonder what color they actually are if they can change color i mean frogs are green some of them right uh mm, frogs are alligators green. crocodiles iguanas can can any of those change color? I'm sure there's a species of frog that can change color. Listen, I'm not I'm not taking away, you know. Grasshoppers are green. Fuck Walk, grasshoppers. Wa walking sticks are green, I think. They change Come color. Come on now, you're being ridiculous. You're being ridiculous with that. Okay. Uh what's your number right. 3 then? Uh green camouflage, like like military fatigues, like the green 
camouflage in the military. Definitely very recognizable. My number three is uh, completely different. It's a watermelon. Don't you besmirch watermelon in my presence. I'm not. Um, I mean, my, my number two is broccoli. So That's your number two? Yeah, because you, I, I, you, I had to put some kind of vegetable on there, and I was thinking of you know green vegetables, and I was trying to think of like what's what's noticeable, like what 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 will what does everybody know of, and it's broccoli one way or the other. Okay, my number two is green lights. What are green? Oh, oh, like stoplights, green lights. Yeah, like driving, like green lights while hmm. driving. That's I could make an argument that's number one. Everybody likes a green light. That's probably one of the most liked things in our society, in any society, is a green light. It's a little slice of hope. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I mean, if you're having a rough morning and you're getting tailgated the shit out of and all you want to do is get going, that green light can be like home free, baby. I feel like you're going to say something ridiculous for your number one. Now, my number one's, my, I mean, my number one's pretty universal, and it's just grass. My number one is trees. Trees are better than grass, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, uh, tomato, tomato to me. I mean, trees are more important uh, to the ecosystem and to the the world, right? But grass, when you think of green, something green, you don't go, man, that, that tree is really green today. It's always the grass. I guess I just don't really like grass, to be honest with you. I've never really enjoyed grass. Like, if you lay on grass, you're going to get itchy. You can't really go out there barefoot. You're just stepping in dog piss. <laughs> so I think that grass has really fallen off over the last 20 to 30 years. Allergies and dogs have brought grass down. I think allergies have brought trees down. Trees are more influential when it comes to spreading allergens 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 <laughs> but nobody's around there bad mouth in trees nobody's ever been like ah oh, sick of all these trees <laughs> fuck the trees fuck the trees right like there's oh, there's well, nobody's out there you you try to cut a tree down in some parts of the country you're going to have to file out some paperwork nobody's worried about your grass i People still got there's an ant there's a strong anti grass movement going on right now I don't know why that's so funny, but it's it's quite funny actually. Um, I I have some I, I have a lot on my honorable mention, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna pick five randomly, and I'll just say those. Um, okay. Let's see. Uh, a peacock. Is a peacock uh, green? Yeah, its feathers are green, aren't they? Mm, I would consider a peacock. It may have some green feathers, but I wouldn't consider it green. What color would you think of? What color do you consider a penguin to be? Black or white? Black. Yeah. I think of a penguin as being black. And I think of a. What the hell was it? A peacock. Peacock. I think of them as being blue. I don't think of right, them as whoa. green. Well, tomato, tomato. Uh, let's see. Like I said, frogs, uh, clover, like a four leaf clover. Let's see. But I'm just randomly, literally going up the list here. Just uh, run, off, run off your list quickly. Just give it this. Give us the whole thing. I'll right. give you a uh, yes or no right after each one. All right. So an athletic field, like a soccer field, football field. Okay. Yeah. Uh, U.S. money. Yeah. Although I don't really associate money with any color anymore. Like money to me is just something that like I don't even know if it's real. <laughs> right. It's <laughs> right. Like. Oh, uh, I don't know. It says this in your bank account, so there must be something in there, or nothing. If you're me, uh, that's kind of that's kind of crazy that our entire society is based on something we're not even sure if it actually exists. Like we've just all kind of agreed that this is there, but we don't know if it's actually there or not. Like those are just some numbers that someone put in there. If you could hack in yeah. and change the numbers, no one could ever tell you that you don't have that in your bank account. Well, if a hacker would, is listening to this and wants to change my numbers for the positive, uh, please, I will not argue against that. Uh, let's see. Uh, John Deere tractor, uh, a green thumb, which I thought was kind of... Not a real thing, by the way. Uh, yeah, well, I don't know. So I, 
you don't seem like somebody who can. Uh, uh, you know, you're not a botanist. Uh, let's see, cactus, caterpillar. Which one of us cut down a tree? Did you cut down a tree? Because I cut down a tree. Technically, that would wouldn't make you a botanist. It would make you the opposite of a botanist. Mm-hmm. Uh, arborist, I believe it's Got an him. arborist. You know, we had a yeah. professional tree climber on this podcast. Do you remember that? That was fascinating. I, do, I remember the headline. I don't. I couldn't tell you when or what episode. He's the best tree climber in the world, though. I know that. Uh, by the way, the, the 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 tag guy was pretty pretty awesome. There's no way that I would last five seconds, and I watched that on TV before. That's kind of an, I mean, it's incredible what those guys that, can do, and women. I don't think I could walk through that course. <laughs> like my knees literally hurt just thinking about it. Uh, what else? What else you got? Give me two more. All right, yeah, I told you. I, I mean, I wrote down a lot. Um, uh, let me see. Okay, lima beans. Hmm? What? Lima beans and spinach. Yeah, nobody likes those, dude. Nobody likes either of those. Um, I have a bunch of like fictional things that I could put on there. Kermit, Green Lantern, Green Goblin, Yoda, Grogu. But I thought about grass, but again, I don't like grass. Green eyes, but I've never been a huge... Like, I don't, I don't know if I know anybody with green eyes. But eyes would be on there. That's all I got. I, I'll, I'll add one more, uh, Shrek, the Grinch, two more, Shrek, the Grinch, and Leprechauns. 